How can those who are young keep their way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord, and teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I've suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept the Lord, the willing praise of my mouth, and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. So, today we're going to continue our series that we've called Foundations. In this series, we've been looking at foundations of faith, the building blocks of every follower of Jesus. We have covered prayer. We talked about Hannah's story. Pastor Courtney talked about Hannah's story. Then Pastor Daniel talked about worship, the foundation of worship for a follower of Jesus. Last week, Pastor Daniel, again, knocked it out of the park by talking about service, Foundation of faith of service. And now today we're going to continue this series by talking about the Bible, the Word of God. I don't know if you could tell from my selection of verses, but if you ever have time, maybe an hour to read Psalm 119, take some time to read it. And I say that because there's, I think it's the longest chapter in the Bible, all right? Tons of verses in Psalm 119, but it's all about following the Word of the Lord, the precepts, the laws, the decrees, everything spoken from the mouth of God. The psalmist says, I will uphold the word of the Lord. So today, I invite you to come with me as I expound four foundational convictions about the Bible. Oh yeah, and I got something really fun underneath this tablecloth too. We have kids joining us in the services this month, as you know, during our family services. And so most of them come during the second service. A lot of them come up to the front and do worship. And so I got a real doozy for them today. But since you are all kids at heart, you are going to love it too. What's under here? Have you been thinking about that? Yes. yes. I know there's some people like, oh, I'm just going to go up and rip that cloth off. All right. We will find out here in a little bit. All right. One is very dangerous. And so I'll have one of the kids come up and handle that one. And then, then, all right, the first foundational conviction of our faith is this. This is for everybody. So if you have a kid in here and they're taking notes on the kid's scripture, they can write this down, is that the Bible is God's word written. That might have been tricky if you're trying to guess my fill in the blanks, right? But the Bible is God's word written. One of the foundational things about Christian faith is that we believe that God has acted that God has acted in history, continues to act in history, but also that God has spoken. In fact, the very first chapter of the scripture says that, and God said, let there be light, and it was so that God acts and speaks, but also this divine speech, the recording and explaining of the divine activity has been committed to writing. So when we say the word of the Lord and we're talking about the Bible or scripture, we believe that this is the word of the Lord written down on, for us now, paper. Some of you have, you know, a tablet or whatever. It's, I guess, digitally written down. But the point is, it was written down, it was first penned down on scrolls, parchment paper. This is the divine speech and the explaining of God's activity written down, committed to writing for us to have. God and humans are factors in this first point, this first conviction of the word of God written. Both are equally involved in the process. So there's a mystery involved, right? The Bible, I like to say it like this, is the Bible is authored by the Lord, inspired by the Spirit, and written by human hands. So when we say the Bible is authored by the Lord, that means that the, that the larger story is all this, from the same author. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's written by human hands. Inspiration by the Holy Spirit, written down by human hands. In other words, humans have a part in the process. 
That's why as we've been studying, this year we've already gone through, I think, four full books of the Bible, I think, so far this year. Jonah sounded a lot different than James, who sounded a lot different than 1 John, who sounded a lot different than Mark, right? And if you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all authored by the same person, inspired by the same person, but they're written by different people. And so that's why you have different emphases, different personalities coming through. Peter sounds a lot different than Paul. I think we understand that, but we have to really grasp the fact that humans are involved in the writing of the, of the scriptures. It isn't some kind of a like guy in a cave and all of a sudden this cloud overtakes his hand and he goes, what is happening, right? God implants the word into one of the human writers and they're inspired by the spirit and so they pen out the words of God. One of the foundational verses to this first point is that the Bible is God's word written is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right there it says inspired or maybe your translation says breathed by God or God breathed. It's inspiration, not dictation. How many of you have a smartphone out there? How many of you have ever told your smartphone to say something in a text? Come on, most of us have, right? And how many of us go, no, that's not what I said, right? <laughs> I think sometimes we view like God is like telling, telling like Siri to write something down, right? If I just said, hey, Siri, set an alarm right now for five minutes. I wonder if 20 different phones are going to go off in five minutes, all right? I've always wanted to do that, but I do it now. Okay. <laughs> this is not dictation. This is not, Charlene, write down the word the. Okay, good. Now write Jesus. Okay, no, it's not dictation. It's inspiration. It's, it's God breathed. Again, it's somehow a human interacting with the living God to produce the word of God written down. Since it is inspired and the Lord is the author, the spirit is the inspirer, this inspirer, it is authoritative for life and ministry. It is the authority for what we make decisions on as Christians. There's no way around it. If this is the word of God written, then we have to go to the word of God for questions about life and ministry. Now, are all questions of life directly answered in scripture? No, but as we read them, the spirit will illuminate the answers that we need to proceed in life. And also in the way we serve one another, it all has to come from Scripture because it's God's Word written, authored by the Lord, inspired by the Spirit, written by human hands. Because it's God-inspired or God-breathed, then it's also trustworthy. So we can trust the Word of God. I know to now, today and, and, and now, nowadays, I don't, I'm saying the wrong word, but in the contemporary world, right, that's really hard. People kind of discount the Bible. Oh, there's, that's an old archaic thing, right? And I don't know about that. I don't know if I can trust that, like... It talks about weird skin diseases in Leviticus chapter 13, right? We have medicine for that or whatever. But the point is, if this is the book that God has authored and is inspired by the Spirit, then again, it's trustworthy. We can trust that it's always going to point us, first of all, to Jesus and then to the life that follows after him. Again, it says it's useful for making us more like him. It says that it's it's useful for teaching. Some of you maybe have the translation that says it's profitable. There's something good that comes out of the scriptures. It's profit. It's a profitable. It's, there's a profit involved for, for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. It's not for condemnation. It's for conviction. It's for spurring people on to be more like Jesus. That's what God's word is. Useful for making us more like Jesus. So it is God's word written. The second foundational conviction is that God still speaks through what he has spoken. Or if you're a kid, have the kids notes, God still speaks to us through the Bible. I have to practice it like that because there's going to be a lot of kids next service. And if I don't say that, I'll just get lost. So just hang with me if there's no kids taking notes on that. It's one thing for me to say that God's word or the Bible is God's word written it's for one, one thing for me to say that, but if I don't continue to develop that, then we can just make, again, that error to say, well, God spoke that 2,000 years ago. So why does that matter for me today? But God still speaks through that which he has spoken. Hebrews 4.12 is really powerful. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, 
sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's alive. It's active. It's not a dead book because it's the spirit-inspired word of God. And the Holy Spirit is alive and active. Come on, somebody. (laughs) This is what John Stott says about scripture. He says, scripture is far more than a collection of ancient documents in which the words of God are preserved. It's not a kind of museum in which God's word is exhibited behind glass like a relic or fossil. On the contrary, it is a living word to living people from the living God, a contemporary message for the contemporary world. That is a foundational conviction that we have to have as Christian Christians, that God still speaks through the word in which he has already spoken. He continues to speak to us today. In fact, that's a really theological word for illumination. As we read, the Holy Spirit illuminates the text for us to see what God has for us and to understand the grand story of God's unfailing love. Illumination is like turning on the light bulb, like the aha, I get it moments. Remember that in old cartoons? Someone would be there and a light bulb would come up. Bing. I remember those cartoons. Okay, come on. I'm tracking. I'm tracking. The Spirit turns on the scriptures, makes it come alive because he is the living God who has inspired the scripture to be written. It's a living word for living people from the living God. And this is one of the things that I love about it, but it's also one of the kind of scary things is as we read the word of God, the word of God ends up reading us. The writer of Hebrews says it judges our thoughts in our hearts, our hearts and our minds. It's able to divide all the little things, the complexities of our life to expose us to the light of the truth. But again, it's a contemporary word for a contemporary world. If you want to know what God says about finances, look to the scriptures. If you want to know what God says about relationships, look to the scriptures. If you want to know what God says about sexuality, look to the scriptures. If you want to know what God says about families, look to the scriptures. Like This is a contemporary message for a contemporary world. And this is the thing through which God continues to speak. And God still speaks today. Amen? Amen. And we're talking about this. I know some of us have those, you know, I wish I was like Moses. I wish God would just show up at a burning bush and rock my world, right? Which would have been an amazing event to see. But I think Moses would have been, man, I would have traded like the rest of the Old Testament and all the New Testament for for the few encounters that I got with God. Or Abraham only had a few different encounters with the Lord where he, he spoke to him. But imagine having the words of the Lord preserved through history. Like we're at a point where I believe some of the characters in the Bible say, man, I really wish I had thousands of pages of what the Lord would say to me and how the Lord can speak to my situation. And this is what we have. And we thank the Lord for it. So the third conviction, uh, foundational conviction about the Bible is that this, the Bible is powerful. The second part of Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, that's what I'm going to focus on. It says the the word of God is alive and active, right? But then it says sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's, It's living and active, Yes, it's alive, but yes, it is also active. It's, again, sharper than a double-edged sword, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So now I'm going to unveil a little revelation for you. Okay, just part of it. Ha, ha, ha. I have a sword. Look at this. This is the thing. I'm going to have a couple boys come up and see if it's really sharp next service. But uh, I'm no, I'm not serious. I'm just kidding, okay? My boys have already tried it, and I just got freaked out, okay? This was a gift to me by Joe Grigsby. He actually, like, wheel, like welded it, and then now I get to wield it for you, but this is kind of cool. Um, on the front there, he stained, he said in mustard, which is pretty cool, but it says Hebrews 4.12. He told me one time when you, when, you, when you talk about the scriptures, you need to bring this up. So here it is, right? But there's a double-edged sword. Like, the idea is being able to go back and forth, back and forth to split things up. It's active. It's powerful. It's able to, again, get in there to divine jo- divide joints and marrow. Any anatomy experts in the room? That's pretty, it's pretty delicate matter, right? Getting in there and separating them. And then he goes, it even judges the thoughts and the hearts. I got to watch out because I don't want to, you know, like, do that and show you that it even, you know, penetrates the hand or whatever, but... 
It's interesting. I could have done so many object lessons on the Bible because it's like, oh, the Bible is like a, it's like a lamp to my feet. It's like a, it's like a light to my path. It's like a double-edged sword. Or in, in um, Ephesians six seventeen, it says like, equip yourself with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Right? It's active. It's powerful. How many of you believe that a sword that's double-edged and sharp is pretty powerful? Right? Let's test it out. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Hebrew says it's like that. And in the passage, it actually says, in, the, in like the context of the passage, it says the Holy Spirit says. And it's talking about a story in Israel. And then ultimately it comes down to like, it says, no, the word of God is live and active. Like God will do what he says he will do. Isaiah 55, 11, this is the Lord speaking to the prophet Isaiah. says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. You might have heard this before, but it does not return to me empty. Or the word of God will not return void. It's powerful. It will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The word of God, God's word, and scripture does the same thing. The word of God written, it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent, which is declare the good news of Jesus, God's Messiah. And when we declare the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that is the power of God to save people, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. That's Romans 1.16. I'm going to throw out a lot of Bible here for you right now, so get ready. John, uh, Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like fire? Imagine if I brought fire on stage today, right? <laughs> Boom, right? Oh, that would have been crazy. <laughs> Declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks rock in pieces. Again, so much, uh, so many pictures in here, so, many, so much imagery. It's like a fire that burns up rubbish. It's, it's like a hammer. The word of the Lord is like a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. James 1 says that the Bible or the word of the Lord is like a mirror that shows us who we are and what we are to do. Again, that's what I say when the word of, we start reading the word of God, it actually starts to read us and show us what we're supposed to be and who, what we're supposed to do. When God speaks, he acts. They're not separate things. The action of God is experienced in the speaking of God. Speech and action are combined in the word written. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be light, and it was so. So as he said, let there be light, <laughs> light happened. Horrible sound effects, I know, but just go with me, all right? Would have been better to do the animals, right? Starting to do the squawking and all that, all right? For me, I think about the power of the Bible when I think of Luke chapter 24 when Jesus is raised from the dead and he's traveling onto the road to Emmaus with the two disciples who are, who are heartbroken, downcast because all of their hopes or dream died when Jesus died. And they're recounting what had happened and Jesus comes alongside them. Hey, what's the matter? He goes, Didn't, are you guys living under, or like, aren't you living under a rock? Don't you know about everything that happened to Jesus the last few days? Jesus says, oh, tell me about it. And so they talk about Jesus. And then Jesus ends up doing this in Luke chapter 24. He ends up opening the scriptures to them. In Luke 24, verse 30 says, they, they, they end up inviting him to come home with Jesus. Jesus wants to go ahead. And then, then Jesus, they invite him to the table. And then Jesus says, or says this in Luke 24. When he was at the table, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? That has like been like forever like singed huh, into my life ever since I was reading that. That as Jesus is opening the scriptures to these disciples and telling them every, all the ways in which scripture pointed to Jesus, that is when their hearts were burning. They realized it was hitting. Oh man, our hearts were on fire when he was going through all of the scriptures and showing how it all pointed to him. And that is my prayer for our church, that our hearts would be set on fire for the Lord as we read the word of God written, as we study the word of God written, as we memorize the word of God written. So the fourth little foundational conviction is the Bible is transformational. And for the kids, it would be the Bible has the power to change me. So I combined the last two and made it three for them. But the Bible is transformational. The Bible has the power to change me. When we were at our uh, sermon prep meeting 
Daniel did a great job and said, hey, why don't you like show how we're supposed to let that happen? How is the transformation process come out? Because again, for a lot of us, maybe you've studied the Bible longer than me and like, I need to sit down and learn from you and I would be humbly willing to do that. Some of you, maybe you're new to your Bibles and not really sure. Okay, well, maybe you're like, well, there's a couple things in here. I kind of avoid the Old Testament because that God's mean or something like that. However you think about it, we need to get the word of God into our lives so it will transform us. And so this is where this little, next little illustration comes in. An object lesson. Are you guys ready? Ooh. The one time I did an object lesson on Easter, everyone said it was the most powerful Easter message ever. And I just, me putting out a bunch of Hawaiian shirts and I never took one off. So so what I have here is two glasses of water. And I have in my hands some, some tea. Now I have five tea bags because you know Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then Old and New Testament. So, you know, <laughs> it's just a really big glass of water, okay? <laughs> but we have we're going to treat the these glasses of water as if they are us, right? And then the the bags of tea as if they are the Word of God. And so as we begin, how do we be transformed? Well, the first thing is you got to read it. So when you read it, it kind of just you kind of dip in, you kind of maybe take short little segments, read a couple of verses, let the word of God get in you, read it some more. It's almost like we're seeing that the Bible is one book on a bookshelf. Maybe there's some dust on it, but we actually have to take it off the bookshelf. We actually have to peel it open and we have to read it. And as we read it, the word of God starts to seep within us. Come on, Lord. <laughs> They're really new to their faith, right? I did try it at home with a lot smaller glass. That's why I got Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Old New Testament. <laughs> Some of you might say, Brandon, how do I read it? Where do I start? Good question. Because I know a lot of people might start in Genesis. You get to like the fourth chapter, fifth chapter, and you're like, these are a lot of names. There's a lot of people lived a long time. I don't really know. Maybe some of you are like, oh, I opened up to the book of Numbers one day, and I got lost in all the numbers. And I would say, don't start there. A good place to start is the book of Mark. That's why we went through it as a church for over a year. It's the smallest gospel. It's short to the point. This is all about Jesus. Start with the gospel of Mark. Again, there's no perfect way to start. So if you're like, well, actually, I think it should be. Okay, then good for you. But start with Mark. That's an easy one. Once you get done with Mark, maybe go to the book of Ephesians. It's a really small letter, six chapters. But it gives you this landscape of the blessings of God, the story of God, and what it means to follow Jesus. And then maybe go back to the Old Testament. I would say go look at the book of Exodus. Because if you know what God did to deliver the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, you will now begin to understand when the New Testament authors, like in the book of Romans or even Galatians, talk about how God redeemed us from our slavery to sin. Like, oh, there's the connection. And so you go beyond reading then and you start to study the Word of God. So studying now involves questions, right? It's a it's digging deeper into the text. It's you asking questions of the text. And ultimately, hopefully, it's you allowing the text to ask questions about you. So as you read something about something in Scripture, you should go, hmm, how is that going to change me? Or how have I, what do I need to change in order to be more like the Word of God? And so as you study the Bible, you dig deep, you ask questions of the text, and let the text ask questions of you. You start to see a change. It's working. Just need time in the Word. <laughs> I need the Word to have some time in you, okay? I think the last, um, uh, for, for Bible study, there's so many different cool resources out here. And you know what, just to kind of kind of highlight our missionary who's in the room, Jim Millard, he has written, I think, like a thousand Bible studies on different books of the Bible. He's created methods, and so you can talk to him after service. Sorry, Jim, now you're going to get bombarded by a bunch of people. But there's a bunch of different Bible study methods out there. There's a different ways to, again, read the text, listen to the text, respond to the text, obey the text, and go share what you've read and share what you've learned. We gave one out on Big Wednesday for our um, Big Wednesday talk. We talked about the Bible and how to study the Bible. And someone came up, our special guest came up and shared what it's like to study the Bible. And so again, there's a bunch of different ways. The idea, though, is to get in and start asking questions. Now, what's going on here? What's the main point? What does God want to say to me? How am I going to be different? 
What do I need to do? Who do I need to share this with based on what I read? Again, simple questions. But if you spent 15 minutes in a section of scripture, you could study it and it will get into your life. Now, the last little thing if you're taking notes is I would say memorize. How many of you know that when life throws you curveballs, it's always good to have the word of God come out of your mouth rather than worry, doubt, expletives, whatever you want to say, all right? It's always good to let what was planted within you come out when you're in those moments. Like, Lord, you meant that for good. Now, memorize. Start with one verse. We, had, we asked Patrick to come up here last week, one of our special guests, and he recited all of Psalm 23, which is six verses, right? He was a little nervous, but he did a great job. I did tell him, hey, you switched from NIV to King James when you said my cup runneth over at some point, but that's okay, all right? He's reciting and memorizing scripture. What that does is you've now let the word of God go inside of you. It's stamped your life, so now you can speak it back out. Like, it's always good to speak the word of God. So start with a verse, start with a section, maybe try a chapter of the Bible. There's people out there who have the time to do the whole New Testament, like praise the Lord, all right? But why not do one verse a day for a month? That would be a lot of verses you would memorize, 30 of them, 28, 29, 30 or 31, depending on what, pick, pick February, okay? <laughs> Try that one out. But the whole point is here is that the Bible is transformational. When we let the word of God get into our lives, when we let it ask questions of us, when we ask questions of it, when we begin to memorize it, we let it sit, again, seep, saturate our lives, what happens? There's now a transformation of identity. In my left hand, your right, is a glass of water. In my right hand is a glass of tea. It's no, no one in here is going to say, well, actually, it's water with some tea steeped out. No, this is tea. You don't go this, this is tea. It's totally different. Water and tea. I don't want to finish today because I know a lot of you might be like, oh, this is, this is good. Good reminder, Brandon. Some of you might be maybe challenged a little bit to let the word of God actually spend some time saturating your life and changing you from the inside out to become a new person, to become more like Jesus. And you're somewhere in between. Maybe someone may be hearing about this for the first time. Maybe someone, this is a great reminder and God will use all of that. But let me remind you what James says in James chapter one. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word that is planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at a fa his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Accept the word of God that's been planted in your life. And don't just listen to it. Do it, because you will be blessed in what you do. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word that is written. We thank you that it is a, light to my, or a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, Lord. We thank you for that. We ask, God, that as we, again, wrestle with some of these convictions, or we ask that, first of all, we would be so aligned with you that we would want to have your word written into our lives. And, Lord, I ask that you would bring people around us that would help spur us on to get the word of God into our lives more. Lord, we cannot do this life without you, but we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word to go before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, as you get ready to head out today, I wanted to remind you of like 25,000 things. So just bear with me here for a second. Not 25,000. 
Tonight we have a prayer and worship chapel starting at 6 o'clock. We have a light dessert afterward. I want to challenge you, invite you to come on out to that. We're, we have kids here praying with us. We have youth praying with us. And we really want to see God move in a powerful way in our church. And we believe that as we gather as the church to pray, that we believe God will, will begin to work and move. Or at least we can see it because of testimonies of God's goodness and grace for us there. So tonight at 6, there's a, a light dessert afterward. Also, if, if you've given your life to Christ and you've never been baptized, next Sunday, Sunday, we're gonna, we want to dunk you under the water, all right? No, we want to see you, well, we will, but we want to see you go down and die to your sin and come up in the newness of life that's in Christ. That's what baptism is. So if you haven't been baptized, sign up for that. We'd love to celebrate what God has done in your life by raising you to new life. Also, in the Connect Hub are some cookies, so you can celebrate Pastor Courtney. Give her a high five. Tell her how great she is. Tell her how much you appreciate her. And tell her how much you're praying for her because we as pastors here on staff need your prayers. Also, if you want prayers from any of us or any of the team, come on up front today. We'd love to pray with you and help care for your needs. Other than that, God bless and have a good day. Say hi to somebody who has a sword that they're going to wield for the Lord. All right, we'll talk to you later.